Where is the Red Hood video? Where is my goddamn Red Hood video mullet? Can't wait for the next video. Red Hood is angry. Keep up the great work. Why is it taking so long to make the Red Hood video? Is it the detailing, the length, or a combination of different factors? What about the Red Hood video that you promise us? What about the new Red Hood video that you promise us is coming? It would be very cool to explore the history of Batman's greatest failure in an entire history video. Red Hood is one of my favorite characters in DC of all time. God, please do a Red Hood video. He's my favorite of the Bat family. Would love to see a Red Hood video. Where's the Red Hood vid? I'm waiting for the Red Hood Jason Todd story you were talking about. How long till it out? Would love to see a Red Hood video. Red Hood is probably my favorite comic book character, so I would love a video about him. Would love to see a Red Hood video. <clears throat> Okay, three, two, one. This month exactly 41 years ago on March 1983, one of the greatest comic book characters ever created made their first appearance. Waldo the Clown, a brilliant, talented circus performer and trusted clown of the first Robin, Dick Grayson. And if you look a little closer, there's Jason Todd. As a Red Hood fan from the early 2000s to now, I've always loved many aspects of the character. Like how he went from a very much alive Robin to a very dead Robin, or how he came back to life and became a villain, from becoming a villain later to an anti-hero, to being an anti-hero turned full-fledged superhero. As time has gone on and more and more stories have come out that have fleshed out Jason's character, Jason's full of intense emotions. He's distrustful, resentful, and most of all fearful of abandonment. And how could he not be, given the entire history of the character? Since about six people give or take have donned the identity of Robin, I don't think any of them in my honest opinion have ever come as close to the abyss than Jason. Now don't get it twisted, each of the Robins have all faced immeasurable darkness. Dick is the carefree, funny, reliable leader of the Robins who watched helplessly as his parents fell to their deaths. Tim is the super smart one whose detective work outshines even the world's greatest detective at times, but he couldn't put the pieces together in time to save his father. And Damien is, well, he's Damien. But for Jason, dying and coming back to life to find that his father figure not only didn't kill the Joker, but had also replaced him, it damages something in Jason that quite honestly can never be repaired. Or maybe it could be, give or take 41 years. Jason Todd by nature is a character that is rebellious, stubborn, resentful, and most of all, he's a character that refuses to change. When I think of Jason's character, I oddly think of a question asked in Skyrim, which I know is so out of nowhere, but I like video games too. I'm not just a comic goopy noopy guy. But the question is, what is better, to be born good or to overcome your evil nature through great effort? Batman says in a story involving Jason that when he met him, he took him under his wing because he saw the raw potential in Jason, and feared that if his rage and brash behavior had not been tempered, he surely would have become a great threat to Gotham. What he says implies that he saw evil in Jason's nature, but had faith that Jason could overcome it through great effort. Spanning over a great 41 years and about 1600 comic book issues give or take, I thought I'd try to go over everything Red Hood because... I guess I really like the color red. So I'm going to try to cover as much of Red Hood's story in as much an entertaining and cohesive way as humanly possible. Going from all the way at the beginning to the somewhat present, I will try to convey the best order of events in Jason's story. Hopefully by watching my video you can learn something you didn't already know, or listen while studying, or maybe play this video to help you fall asleep, since I do that myself sometimes with lore videos all the same. I'm looking at you. Going from a complete copy and paste of Dick Grayson with no sense of style, to a total timeline change later that made Jason's character infinitely more interesting, having Jason forced to grow up in the roughest part of Gotham where all his life he had to live like it was every man for himself. Until one removal of attire, and maybe a vote to kill him off 18 issues later, thrust Jason down a spiral of events he could have never foreseen, becoming the infamous Red Hood, and Batman's greatest failure. This is the complete history of Jason Todd. Now before we delve into pre-crisis Jason Todd, I first have to paint the picture of what the state of Batman comics were at the time. It's not like a really crazy thing to talk about, but it just kind of clears up a few things in the menagerie that is the Batman mythos. Now at this point, Batman comics were slowly starting to creep up towards the darker and edgier years. Batman can't hold a relationship for the life of him, Commissioner Gordon has a heart attack, Dick Grayson, the first Robin, was starting to grow up and mature into the role of Nightwing, simultaneously leading the Teen Titans, and the writers wanted Robin back, but they didn't want to backtrack from Dick's story, so they instead decided to bring in Jason Todd to the fold, with an extremely similar origin to Dick Grayson by making him and his family trapeze performers. Yeah, they either really didn't try or they were just too afraid to make a new Robin with an entirely new origin. Because Jason and Dick's origin kind of play out the same. 
where the same protection racket scheme is played on the Todd family just as it was the Flying Graysons. The Graysons refuse to pay, leading to Tony Zuko tampering with their trapeze equipment, causing the ultimate deaths of Dick's parents. The same thing pretty much happens, only somewhere along the way Killer Croc gets involved through a subplot and ends up kidnapping Jason Todd's parents. During this time, Jason also figured out the secret identities of Batman and Robin, so he dons this fucking costume and tries to save his parents alongside the dynamic duo, only to horribly fail and witness his parents be fed to crocodiles. Witnessing this horror which would scar Jason for his entire life, leaving him with endless torment, Batman's like, alright, I guess you're mine now. And Bruce Wayne adopts Jason Todd. Jason, upon living with Bruce, tries to convince Bruce that he could make a great sidekick, believing he could be just like Dick Grayson in every way, arguing that the two even have the same backgrounds. But Bruce, at first, is extremely reluctant to make Jason an official partner. So Jason works hard to win over his adopted father's approval, by helping Batman solve several cases by looking at it through different angles, solving some of his own cases, and training endlessly. As it's virtually the only distraction keeping Jason sane after losing his parents in the most brutal way imaginable. Jason also keeps in touch with the infamous Waldo the Clown, who ends up taking Jason hostage for a couple million dollars. But after getting himself out of that sticky situation by himself with a couple twists and turns, finding out that Waldo the Clown wasn't really Waldo the Clown, but was just some guy disguised as Waldo the Clown, from here Jason goes through several really terrible costume designs and name changes as a running gag, trying to instill on Batman to call him Ishmael, but after Batman calls him Robin 37 times, Jason has enough. After this, Jason dyes his hair, gains the approval from Dick Grayson, and dons the Robin costume, taking down the Joker as his first act. Beyond this, there are like multiple weird stories where I think Jason fights off wild monkeys and stuff. It's kind of hard to remember, but one moment I found to be very interesting was when Jason as Robin fights off Crazy Quilt, having no idea what to expect and ends up getting beaten to a pulp. To sum the guy up, Crazy Quilt's like this Batman villain who had a huge fascination for colorful quilts until Dick accidentally blinded him forever. Through Dick's actions, Crazy Quilt became Robin's arch nemesis, which means when Crazy Quilt runs into Jason as Robin, he thinks it's the same person and Jason is completely unprepared to face off against who's supposed to be his arch nemesis leading Jason to really see just how dangerous becoming Robin truly is. From here on out, Jason matures a bit and sees that being Robin isn't a game. Going out fighting crime as the dynamic duo could mean life or death, becoming a better Robin for it, as the issues would slowly come up to Batman and Robin's ultimate test in the spectacular Batman issue number 400. Throughout Jason's journey fighting crime with Batman, they'd managed to pretty much house Arkham Asylum with most of Batman's rogues gallery. Everything became pretty good in Gotham, Almost too good, because on the anniversary of Bruce Wayne donning the cowl, Ra's al Ghul, the dude who dips himself in a vat of Baja blast to regain his youth and also leads the League of Shadows, <coughs> it's actually the League of Assassins, shut up, who also desperately wants Batman to sleep with his daughter, devises a plan to break out every single one of Batman's villains to break the Batman. And since Ra's al Ghul knows Batman's identity, he makes each of his villains kidnap people close to Bruce, such as Alfred, Commissioner Gordon, Vicki Vale, and Harvey Bullock. Many times, Bruce almost succumbs to Raish's plan to break the Batman if not for Jason holding him up and helping defeat each of his colorful villains. Fighting through everything and Batman overcoming Ra's al Ghul, everyone Batman holds dear is brought to the Batcave to celebrate their victory over Raish, with Jason bringing down a huge cake for everyone to dig into. All except for Bruce, who doesn't view this as a day for celebration. More like a new beginning of evil let loose over Gotham, as it is the constant cycle of his crusade. Fucking Debbie Downer over here. Beyond this issue, it had marked the end of this timeline because of an event called Crisis on Infinite Earths that saw the destruction of several different worlds in the multiverse. A cold, uncaring, uncompromising being of pure energy that saw to the end of all things, wiped out world after world until there'd be nothing left but a handful of superheroes from all different parts of the multiverse left to stop it. Long story short, the heroes ended up succeeding, and in doing so, a world was created that would converge all different worlds, timelines, and so on to fit one sole Earth, changing everything as we know it, including that of Jason Todd's character. And it's even here where we get some pretty good Jason Todd stories where he's featured as Robin before reaching his ultimate demise, like Batman the Cult, The Diplomat's Son, Did Robin Die Tonight? and of course, Death in the Family. So to start, we'll begin with how Jason Todd was reintroduced as an entirely new character, completely different from the Robin we were just talking about a second ago, in Batman issue number 408. 
where we would see Batman comics beginning to take a nosedive into much darker themes. In this new timeline, we're reintroduced to the original Batman and Robin, putting an end to the Joker's pesky games. They're all pretty much going through the motions. They're either dodging gunfire, yelling out some clever line, or landing a few punches and kicks. But on this night, in a freak accident, Dick gets shot in the arm and nearly dies, if not for Batman being there. Getting shot, it nearly leads to the Joker's escape, if not for Batman saving Robin and stopping Joker from sheer luck. On this night, Batman realizes that putting a child in constant danger by fighting crazed villains would mean that Bruce would be at fault if Dick were to die. Reaching the manor, Batman decides with absolutely no hesitation to fire Robin on the spot. Dick is obviously pretty pissed off that he's forbidden to be Robin ever again, but Bruce views it as more of a step towards Dick's destiny to be a greater hero than he could ever be. Saying this to Dick, he goes along with Bruce's choice and leaves the manor onto a journey of self-discovery. But the duo leave on sort of weird terms and with a lot left unsaid to each other. After this, a few months go by and as far as the world knows, Robin is claimed dead. Commissioner Gordon shows some concern to which Batman tells Gordon that Robin is very much alive, but the title of Robin will remain dead, vowing to never put another child at risk ever again. Going forward, Bruce pays tribute to his parents on the anniversary of the night they died by patrolling around Crime Alley all night long. While patrolling, he meets a woman known as Ma Gunn, who runs one of the orphanages in Gotham City. They share a brief conversation about how Batman will have a quiet night tonight, because criminals know better than to prowl the streets on this particular date. Since he's come to this spot once every year for six years, Batman quickly changes the subject before Ma Gunn can deduce his identity in seconds, and says that he's glad he can finally meet the famous Ma Gunn, who runs one of the best orphanages in Gotham City, wishing her good luck on raising the next generation of kids. On the walk back to the Batmobile, Batman finds that it's missing a tire, to his surprise, making Batman let out a laugh something he's never done in Crime Alley before. Shortly after this, while inspecting the car, Jason Todd returns to the scene of the crime to steal another tire. And while Batman's like, alright kid, I'm gonna need that tire back, Jason Todd hits him with a tire iron and calls him a boob. Batman lets Jason go so we can see where the kid lives, in which Jason returns home and sparks up a joint. With Jason's guard down, Batman kinda just lets himself in and roasts the shit out of Jason, saying, uh, do you, uh... Do you live here? Batman asks where his parents are, and Jason says that he doesn't know where his dad is, and his mom died after being sick for a while. So Batman seeing that the environment clearly isn't suitable for Jason, he makes the kid roll the tire to the Batmobile, and enrolls Jason at Ma Gunn's school for boys so he can have a good roof over his head. But upon leaving, everything isn't what it seems, and it turns out that Ma Gunn is an old coot who uses children to commit crime. And it's honestly kind of funny, because instead of teaching the boys subjects like math, English, history, or science, she just teaches the kids how to sell drugs or to use guns properly. Giving kids pop quizzes on what attachment can lower recoil on an M4, or what kind of pistol would be preferable to kill somebody without getting caught. But she draws the line at her boys doing drugs though. That's good I guess. And yet hands them bottles of booze like they're water bottles at a Little League game. Jason leaves Ma Gun's school for boys not wanting to become a part of her gang, so he goes back to stealing and selling tires for quick cash. This however gets the attention of Batman and he's like, what the fuck? I told you to learn something. But Jason tells Batman that he did learn something that Ma Gunn runs a kindergarten for criminals. Batman at first doesn't believe him, but when investigating Ma Gunn, he catches her in the act of stealing jewels with some of the boys. With the help of Jason showing that he can handle himself by defeating Ma Gunn, Batman just makes Jason Robin on the spot with no training or anything. So after six months of grueling training, Jason learned a great many skills along the way, like how to perfect his hand-to-hand -hand combat by besting Bruce, perfecting his skills on all variations of weapons, including even the ones that Batman scorns, and finally perfecting his detective skills. After so much training to become Robin, the Batcave pretty much became a second home to Jason. Once Bruce felt that Jason had finally reached the point to officially become Robin, Alfred steps in and is basically like, are you sure you want to put another kid in this costume to be your partner? He could like blow up in 20 issues later, don't you think? And Batman's like, yeah, I know, but... I'm still gonna do it anyway. So Bruce pronounces to Jason that he is now officially the new Robin, giving him a fitted costume with some added improvements, like putting soft body armor in the suit, but doesn't think to maybe add pants? I don't know, he's Batman fucking prep time or whatever. Bruce at this point felt more than ever like the void Dick Grayson left behind was finally filled, and yet there was still something that was off between Jason and himself. Something Jason picked up on particularly every time Two-Face had ever been mentioned. It's because Two-Face killed Jason's dad. Batman introduces the new Robin to Gordon, and Gordon's like, Bro, didn't you just swear off putting children in the front lines like six months ago? And Batman says that he's older than the both of them combined with the kind of childhood he's at. And Gordon just goes, yeah. Okay, 
That checks. Gordon then gives Batman word on Two-Face's evil plot to rob a casino with a pair of criminal twins. And long story short, Batman and Robin show up to stop Two-Face's plan, and Jason proves to be an exceptional Robin by dissolving a hostage situation by giving himself up. <laughs> Two-Face brings Jason to his car, attempting to escape, and Two-Face is just like, here's my customized two-door. How do you like it? While distracted, Jason makes a clean getaway and soon reunites with Bruce back at the cave where he's told that what he did was a very brave thing and was something that the last Robin would have done as well. After this, Bruce heads on up to get some sleep while Jason decides to stay up a little longer to do some research on Two-Face, where he discovers Two-Face killed his father. And Jason, rightfully so, gets angry with Bruce and almost kills Two-Face with his bare hands when they next meet. It was here where I kind of saw why people at the time maybe didn't like Jason because he was the angry one. But like, if your stepdad withheld the most important information concerning your parents' killer, wouldn't you get a little upset too? Despite this, Jason still sets aside his differences with Bruce and when given the chance, he chooses to spare Two-Face, no longer feeling hatred towards him, but rather pitying Two-Face and the life he leads. After this, Jason is just in the sidelines for a majority of the time as Robin, fighting death metal cosplayers, fighting a samurai with Batman, casually makes Scarecrow overdose off of Fear Toxin, fights a Terminator Gordon, joins the Teen Titans for a spell. Then there's a fucking Bush guy somewhere in the middle of all of this. I don't know. It kind of just all blurs together at some point. And after so many extraordinary adventures as the new Robin, this catches the attention of Dick Grayson, now Nightwing, who was a little bit pissed with Bruce because the guy said he wouldn't involve a kid in a dangerous life like this. So he comes to Gotham to try and understand why Bruce threw him away and meet the new Robin. So while Jason is on patrols alone and thinking he's a lot better at crime fighting than he actually is, he ends up making the mistake of not surveying an illegal coke lab properly and ends up getting binked over the head by the rooftop guards. Robin crashes through the lab's skylight window, smack in the middle of everyone, and ends up in a bit of a pickle. Till motherfucking Nightwing shows up and gets all angry telling everyone in the coke lab that if they all want their teeth still they'll have to surrender but one of the thugs says well if anything you're trespassing on our coke lab and have no right to be here you need to leave now before we trespass you nightwing's like yeah okay we clearly made a mistake here sorry about the skylight here's some money to fix it as they leave the lab nightwing yells at jason to tell batman how he screwed up tonight and to tell bruce that he'll stop by the cave tomorrow to have a chat and jason's like holy shit how do you know Batman is Bruce Wayne? Jason of course fills Bruce in on everything that happened, and Bruce tells Jason that Nightwing was the original Robin. Bruce never divulged that information for Dick's sake, but now it only seems fair. With that information, Jason's a bit worried that Dick may have come back to have his old job again. However, Bruce assures to Jason that Dick definitely doesn't want to be Robin ever again. Hours later, Nightwing walks into the cave to confront Batman about Jason. And mind you, at this point, they haven't talked to each other in 18 months, and Dick says to Batman that he feels like after he set on his journey, of self-discovery, they left a lot unsaid. After all, they were the dynamic duo for years until the Joker landed one lucky shot on Dick, which changed everything between them. Batman fired Dick, kicked a great big hole in his life, and just walked out. At the very least, Dick thought Batman would at least wish Dick farewell, but he didn't even bother to leave the cave to say goodbye to Dick. After which, Dick went to give college a try, but that didn't work out at all. So Dick went to live a life on the road for a hot minute till he inevitably began to spend a lot of time with the Titans. But Bruce never reached out, and it bothered him. So Dick demands to know why Bruce not only went back on his word hiring on a child to be Robin, but also just cut him off from his life entirely, yelling for the truth, which angers Bruce enough to lose all composure. Bruce tells Dick the truth, that it was because he was lonely and he missed Dick but now he'd very much like it if Dick saw himself out. So the two say their goodbyes, and Jason witnesses Dick pull out from the manor. Later that night, out on patrol, Robin manages to run into Nightwing, who's been waiting for him, and tells Jason that he figured he'd find the new lab, so he'd like to help Jason bust it together. But before doing so, he gives Jason a box containing Dick's original Robin costume, and tells him that he'll grow into it in a few years. If only. Along with that, he gives Jason his number so that whenever Jason has problems with Batman, he can call Dick and vent giving Jason something Dick never had, a brother. After which the pair take down the thugs running the coke lab within two minutes, they round up the evidence, and from the thrill of their victory, they say their goodbyes, while Batman watches over from a nearby rooftop, just smiling. Now, the more and more Jason starts to go out as Robin after this, he really begins to see how ugly Gotham can be, which fills Jason Todd with so much hatred for crime, willing to even kill. Of course, Batman tries to steady the course, but it doesn't do much good. Jason still feels like the world would be better off if they just followed through and killed criminals. So he tries to tell Robin that they can't be murderers, even if it may be for something good. If they do that, 
they'll be just like the evil they swore to fight against. But Jason doesn't see it that way. And this is where Jason begins to slip, questioning if Batman's code is really working at the end of the day. Because if they're taking in these villains who will kill or hurt others whenever given the chance to Arkham Asylum or Blackgate, which, let's face it, is one big revolving door, Jason can't help but see in his perspective how redundant crime fighting is. If the same criminals he brought in who sell drugs to kids or kill or torture or rape others are back on the streets before sunup. And it starts to form this solidity with Jason that maybe killing criminals and showing a little follow through is truly the only way to cleanse Gotham. And this mindset is actually put to the test in my favorite Jason Todd Robin story ever called The Diplomat's Son. While Jason is swinging through Gotham like a guardian angel, he hears a woman's cries for help within a penthouse. Having no idea what to expect from seeing this through, he crashes through a window into the building, leading a man by the name of Philippe Garzones to come out of the bedroom confused out of his mind. Philippe charges toward Robin, but Robin takes him out with ease using his sheer skill and speed. After which, Jason follows the cries for help coming from the bedroom. And upon opening the bedroom door, he finds a woman under the covers begging over and over, please don't hurt me. Later, Batman and Robin take Philippe and the woman by the name of Gloria to the GCPD where she'd be able to give her statement describing that this is the second time he's assaulted her, violated her. They had their first date together a while back, and she had no idea what kind of monster he turned out to be. And the only reason she didn't file a report for the first assault was because she was ashamed and wanted it to go away. She wanted to forget it. Jason here affirms to Gloria that Philippe won't be getting away. He has charges of kidnapping, assault, resisting arrest. Philippe is gonna do hard time for sure. But then Gordon walks in and says that Robin is wrong, because in Philippe's statement, he says Gloria came to his apartment uninvited, and Gloria got a black eye from tripping into the door, adding that when Philippe tried breaking it off with Gloria, she tried causing trouble, and his men all back up this statement, so they have to let Philippe go. And even if the charges could stick with Philippe, it wouldn't matter much because of Philippe's father being the ambassador of, and please excuse me if I pronounce it wrong, Bosatego, giving him and Philippe complete immunity. Given this, Gloria goes into panic because since Philippe has complete immunity, he can come after Gloria again anytime he wants. Gloria ends up in such a shock that she'd end up having to be sedated and sent to the hospital, while Philippe walked out the door like it was just another Tuesday. Jason, you can imagine, is pretty pissed off that this scumbag gets to walk, but Batman has an idea on how they can bust Philippe, even with his immunity. Now, if they were to catch Philippe with cocaine on his person or using, Philippe would have proper cause to be sent home in disgrace. With that, they follow Philippe all throughout Gotham for days, waiting for Philippe to make a mistake. Watching his daily routine of going out for high-priced lunches and getting high, then at night he gets even higher and parties at clubs. In the meantime, Jason can't stand the thought of someone like Philippe still sucking air, and his patience to nab the guy is dwindling fast. So during their stakeout, Philippe finally makes a mistake driving to one of his father's smuggling rings while Batman and Robin do a close follow. Philippe enters the operation to get a half lit of coke, and that's when Batman and Robin show up. They spring into action and bust the whole operation before they can even blink, and when they finally take down everyone, it comes down to Philippe pressed against a wall, quivering in fear, as Jason walks over to Philippe, just begging for Philippe to resist, so that he'd have an excuse to beat the ever-living shit out of him. But Philippe never resists. An hour later, Philippe is spring from custody, but he has to pack his bags and fly back home. But Philippe, the little insecure coward he is, he doesn't like losing, so he walks over to a nearby phone to make a call before leaving. On the phone, he asks who's on the other end if they're looking really foxy tonight and if they're ready to see him again, because he'll be over again later tonight, as Philippe ends the call saying it loud enough so Robin can hear that we'll talk more later, Gloria. Hasta luego. Philippe leaves the building soon after, and Robin in a panic tries calling Gloria to tell her she's in no danger, but she won't pick up the phone. Batman and Robin fly through Gotham as fast as humanly possible to Gloria's apartment, kicking down the door, shouting that everything's okay, until Jason opens Gloria's bedroom door to find Gloria dangling from the ceiling, with a rope tied around her neck. Gloria was so afraid of Philippe returning, she felt like the only escape possible from that monster was suicide. Gloria was simply too fragile for a world inhabited by monsters like Philippe Garzonas, and all Jason sees at this point is Red, ditching Batman. Over at Philippe's apartment, Philippe reflects to himself on his time in Gotham, with the monster's only concerns being that he won't be able to do coke anymore, or that he won't be able to take advantage of women, having not a care for the wrong he's caused. 
until Jason puts the fear of God into Philippe, with the man tumbling down to his doom only moments later just as Batman arrives too late to save him. And after a brief moment, Batman asks Robin, did Philippe fall, or was he pushed? And Jason replies that he guessed he spooked him. He slipped, as Jason swings off with nothing more to say, leaving it up in the air if Philippe really did slip, or if Jason pushed him. Now remember Philippe's dad? Yeah, he comes back and holds Commissioner Gordon hostage with a little note to Batman saying, come without police and bring Robin. Oh no, it's the consequences of my actions. So Bruce acts like everything is normal and heads out as Batman, refusing to fill Jason in on what's going on to protect him. But Jason smells something funny. Driving to Wally's junkyard, Batman knows this is a trap, so he sneaks around, picking one thug off at a time. So Batman essentially beats up all 30 kajillion thugs until it comes down to him and Philippe's father. Confronting Jose Garzonas, he demands for Robin, but Batman kind of just stands awkwardly. Robin shows up! And Batman throws a tower made of cars on top of a bereaved father, killing him. Accidentally. Robin's like, Batman, who were these guys? And Batman tells him that it's Philippe's father, and some of his thugs. As Batman tells Jason that for every action in this universe, there is an opposite and equal reaction. Robin looks behind Batman to all the hurt caused from Philippe's death, and learns that sometimes the good guys don't always win in the end. Sometimes actions can have unforeseen consequences. Sometimes people die. Sometimes even the ones closest to us. Sometimes there's a death in the family. Yeah, you see what I did there, didn't you? Batman and Robin are on a mission to bust a group of thugs that take no-no photos of children, and Batman is waiting on the GCPD to come busting in and help if needed. Only Jason loses his patience at the thought of children being photographed in such a way. So much that he starts to brutally beat up the criminals. Batman helps Robin, but he sees something in Jason. A rage all too familiar to him. A rage that will one day get him killed. So later Bruce decides alongside Alfred that Jason can no longer be Robin. Jason overhears this and soon ditches the manor to get away from Bruce, feeling like the only people he could rely on betrayed him. Meanwhile, the Joker breaks out of Arkham Asylum, and this becomes more a priority than Jason and his feelings after what the Joker did. Since only a few issues prior, the Joker crippled Barbara and tortured Commissioner Gordon in The Killing Joke. Gordon gets everyone in on the case. He calls in the Justice League, the Teen Titans, Batman, while somewhere in Gotham, Joker's planning on how to get out of the country, thinking about getting into international politics and some way he can sell a nuke he's just had lying around for some time. During the chaos, Jason walks through Gotham, subconsciously leading himself back to his old neighborhood where an old lady calls out to him. Meeting the old lady, she gives Jason a bunch of his parents' old things that she managed to take before the landlord shuffled everything out of the building. Bringing his family belongings back to the manor, Jason sifts through old photos, documents, etc. But when he gets to his birth certificate, he finds out his long-lost mother may still be alive, going by a different name that starts with the letter S. This means Catherine Todd, the mother he grew up with that died, was his stepmother. But Jason doesn't give two shits about her anymore. His real mother's somewhere out there alive and kicking. So Jason takes some documents and searches all over for women with the first name that starts with S. Jason cross-references these names in the back computer to find Sharman Rosen, who emigrated to Israel to work for the Israeli Secret Service. The second lady is Lady Shiva, trained assassin and mercenary for hire in Lebanon. And finally, Dr. Sheila Haywood, working on famine relief efforts in Ethiopia. Spoilers. It's Sheila Haywood, who turns out to be Jason's mother. With all the info Jason needs, he steals some of Bruce's credit cards and books a first-class ticket to Israel. Along Jason's travels, he runs into Bruce who's hot on the trail to finding Joker. And Bruce is like, what the fuck are you doing in Israel? And Jason's like, what the fuck are you doing in Israel? So they both catch each other up on the situation with Joker and Jason's mother, where they both agree to team up to solve each other's problems. Batman and Robin stop the Joker from selling the nuke, and one by one they ask each of the women if they've ever given birth in Gotham. Kind of forward, but anyway. After Joker's defeat, he looks up Sheila Haywood. Jason's mother, who was in Ethiopia smuggling drugs for a refugee camp. So Joker, with no money, no assets, no anything to his name, blackmails Sheila so he can steal several trucks full of supplies to sell off to get back on his feet. After interrogating Lady Shiva, Bruce and Jason arrive to the camp in Ethiopia where Sheila Haywood is stationed. And upon the pair meeting her, they instantly know that Sheila is Jason's mother. 
and Jason is more thrilled than you can imagine. So they spend a while getting to know each other until his mother goes off to do work around the camp. While helping people in the camp himself, Jason spots the Joker working with his mother to steal trucks loaded with medical supplies. Desperate to save his mother from the Joker, Batman tries to convince Jason to stay out of the matter and to not go in alone. But because it's his mother, Jason goes in anyway against Batman's wishes. So Jason tries his best to stop the Joker alone to save his mother, giving it his all, until his mother double-crosses him in the process. Because if Jason were to stop the Joker, that'd also mean that Sheila's embezzling scheme would be uncovered, ruining her life. With that, the Joker gets the upper hand and brutally beats on Jason almost to the brink of death. After having his fill, he basically makes Sheila's betrayal meaningless by having her tied up inside the warehouse, leaving them both to die together, trapping them inside the warehouse with a bomb set for 10 minutes. Now, a lot of the time, people regard Jason's final moments as dying as a victim of the Joker's acts, and that very much may be true. But Jason, even after being betrayed by his mother, been to a bloody pulp, pretty much chewed on and spat back out, remains a hero regardless of it all, and attempts to save his mother even after everything she's done. Yet sadly, his efforts aren't enough, and Bruce arrives too late to save either of them. Bruce spots Jason from the wreckage and cradles Jason's lifeless body in his arms, as a flood of memories rush over Bruce. But all Bruce can feel now, looking back on these proud memories, is shame and failure, as this would mark the moment in Bruce's career as his greatest failure. When Bruce returns home with Jason for the funeral, it's one of the most depressing things you can ever imagine. Since Jason was an orphan, he only had so few people show up and actually grieve over his death. After Jason's burial, Bruce swears to Alfred that he will never have another Robin ever again, and that he has one final score to settle with the Joker. But what Bruce doesn't find out until later is that the Joker ends up becoming an international ambassador of Iran, giving the Joker full diplomatic immunity. So Batman absolutely fuming, can't do anything to the Joker to make him pay for his crimes. Bruce debates with himself on whether or not the Joker deserves to die, and if he could actually go through with it when the time comes. Because by this point, Joker has just gone too far. So Bruce somehow builds up enough patience to reach out to the Joker one last time to help him, to end this once and for all. Yet, Joker refuses. What follows is the Joker making an attempt to gas the UN, until Batman puts a stop to the Joker. A crazy gunfight ensues aboard a helicopter between the Joker, his goons, and Batman, and when one of the goons starts shooting frantically, even after everything the Joker has done, all the horror he's caused, and now presented with the opportunity for Joker to meet his maker, Batman leaps into the gunfire and saves his life. After the fight, Joker ends up going missing, and just like the way it always ends between Batman and the Joker, it ends completely unresolved without any closure. So, Jason Todd is dead, and Batman's story goes on and on and on and on without him. Jason doesn't come back. It's not like one of those character deaths like Superman where they die for six months and then come back because of some science mumbo jumbo or time travel or an alternate world. For all intents and purposes, Jason Todd is dead, and a lot of stuff happens when he's gone. Like a lot. And I feel the need to fill in the blanks instead of just skipping two decades worth of info so you can understand a few things. As you can imagine, after Jason's death and the confrontation with Joker, Batman starts slipping. He becomes increasingly bitter, he no longer takes proper care of himself, doesn't sleep, and where he could take out a pair of goons in seconds, he struggles like it's his first time out as Batman. So a young boy by the name of Tim Drake bursts onto the scene. He deduces that Batman is Bruce Wayne, Jason Todd was Robin before dying, and Dick Grayson is Nightwing. Tim Drake seeing that his hero Batman is going down the deep end dramatically fast, he figures that Batman needs a Robin to keep the darkness within him in check. Tim initially doesn't even want to be Robin, and instead tries to convince Dick to do it. It's only when Dick refuses that Tim takes up the mantle to help Batman and Nightwing. After proving himself to Bruce, Bruce takes what happened with Jason, learning from it and recruits Tim Drake into the fold as the new Robin, only after Bruce is 1 million percent sure he'll be ready. After that, some pretty crazy stuff happens, like Bane gets introduced and comes out the cut breaking Batman's back, so another guy comes into play as the new Batman known as John Paul Valley, who's a wicked brutal Batman that Bruce chose to be his successor, that turns out to not be quite the best pick whatsoever. Then Bruce gets his back rearranged, saves Gotham, 
Then Gotham crumbles due to an earthquake becoming a wasteland and declared no longer part of the United States because it's just so bad. Then ends up divided into territories held by the most powerful figures like Poison Ivy, Mr. Freeze, Bane, Penguin, and a multitude of other villains. Then after a bit of shenanigans, Gotham is deemed part of America again. And for a whopping 17 years, Jason never returns. Sure, he's mentioned every so often, or in a dream sequence, or in a fear-induced nightmare to torment Batman, but he never returns. And in Gotham Knights issue number 45, we get this very sad story where essentially Felix Desiduro, a member of Child Protective Services, decides to investigate Bruce Wayne and his adopted family. Since Jason Todd died under the care of Bruce, he's a little sussed out by Bruce and feels like he may not be a suitable parent. So Felix interviews every member of the family, like Cassandra Kane. Alfred, Dick Grayson, Tim Drake, until it comes down to Bruce Wayne, where Felix asks for Bruce's perspective on losing Jason. And it's just one of the saddest set of panels I can ever lay my eyes on. To sum it up, Bruce says that he bit off more than he could chew, and thought he could take Jason, a boy full of pain and heartache, and turn him into something better. Bruce thought he could turn his life around. And when Jason learned that his mother was alive, Bruce let Jason have that hope that they could be reunited, and that he could finally be happy as that's all Bruce ever wanted for Jason. Bruce just went about it all wrong, and Jason was killed because of it. Saying this, he bawls his eyes out remembering Jason. Afterwards, Felix essentially apologizes for doubting that Bruce is a good father, and lets him off the hook. With that, the whole Bat family hush up to pay tribute to Jason Todd, and remember him as the self-sacrificing hero that put others before himself. Did somebody say hush? So this villain known as Hush comes onto the scene, and really makes a name for himself. Like, right out of the gate, by essentially putting Batman through a gauntlet comprising of all of his villains. Like Poison Ivy, Riddler, Killer Croc, Joker, Harley Quinn, Jason Todd, Clayface. Wait. Back up. Back up. Jason Todd? So, setting the stage, Hush through a series of events captures Tim Drake and holds him hostage at the site of Jason's burial to have a confrontation with Batman. Keep in mind, Batman has no clue who Hush really is throughout the story. I mean, he has a few ideas, but the last thing he'd ever expect is for Jason Todd to be Hush. So upon unmasking, Batman's like, oh shit, Jason's back from the dead. And this could kind of make sense. I mean, tons of heroes die and come back to life, so why not Jason? So Jason, referring to Tim Drake as the pretender Robin, keeps threatening to kill him in front of Batman to get back at Batman for letting the Joker kill him. Until Catwoman dissolves the situation by getting Tim Drake free. What follows is a Raid Redemption Jason Bourne fight sequence between Batman and Jason as Jason keeps yelling that the Batman failed him. He let him die. And worst of all, he didn't even kill the Joker. Eventually the two get separated as a chase ensues until Batman inevitably catches up with Jason. And Batman knows that whomever this pretender may be, he is not Jason Todd. He may have all the facts, but somewhere deep down, Batman knows that Jason would never become the monster he sees in front of him. Long story short, Batman stops Hush, fails to riz up Catwoman, and pshhh, Superboy punches holes in the fabric of space and time. And Jason gets brought back to life from the cosmic powers of retcon. This is probably the part of the video a lot of you skip to, and for that, shame on you. Go flip your card to red, Michael. Now. Jason freaks out like anyone else would if they found out that they were in a Mr. Beast video against their will and screams for help, calling out to Bruce. But no one comes. So Jason uses what he has on his person, like his belt, and strikes his casket until he can dig himself out from his own grave. And to make it even better, Jason also still had his injuries from when the Joker torched him, like a cracked skull, several broken ribs, coupled together with some internal bleeding. And yet Jason pulled himself out through sheer will. After which Jason walked for 12.5 miles aimlessly until a lost couple found him and rushed him to a nearby hospital. When brought in, Jason fell under a coma due to severe brain bleed causing massive brain damage. So with no proper identification, they have no idea who he is, and due to Jason's brain damage, he can't identify himself either. So the hospital registers Jason into a home under the alias of a John Doe. Eventually, Jason would end up awaking from his coma with very limited brain activity. He'd be completely unresponsive to anything, but his body's instincts would end up kicking into high gear as Jason would end up escaping from the home. His instincts helped him survive on the streets of Gotham. When cold, he stole clothes. When hungry, he stole food. When tired, he'd find shelter wherever possible. 
and if he ever got into a nasty fight, all his training as Robin kicked into gear to instinctively defend himself. Eventually, Jason would make enough noise that it would get the attention of one of Bruce's love interests, Talia al Ghul. So Talia sneaks Jason into the pit to hopefully cure his brain damage, which ends up being a complete success. But before he can process any of it, he's rushed out of Nanda Parbat with a kiss goodbye from Talia. Kinda weird, but moving on. Jason catches up with everything that had happened, and the only thing he could think about most is why Bruce never killed the Joker. When he was ready to return to Gotham, Hush was already running amok torturing Bruce, so Jason saw that as an opportunity to twist the knife inside Batman by revealing his identity. Among other things, Jason also posed as Hush so he could get close to Bruce to maybe see him emote some feeling of sadness or deep regret at the sight of Jason's face. But Bruce didn't give him that. So when separated for only a moment, Jason switched places with Clayface and escaped. When returning back to one of his bunkers, Jason felt that he had lost his father and that there was no going back. He could never be Robin ever again. That much was clear. He was now only Jason Todd, but he would need a new alias. One with meaning. One that'd strike fear. Jason would choose the Joker's old alias Red Hood to own the event that changed him forever. Under the guise of Red Hood, Jason targets several gang operations ran by Black Mask, so to get the attention of Batman. Red Hood also simultaneously takes ownership over several different gang families in Gotham after lopping each of their lieutenants heads off and stuffing them in a duffel bag, giving the families orders that they can continue to sell drugs so long as they don't sell the children and no dealing in schoolyards. But they'll have to kick up 40% of the take to Red Hood if they want to be protected from either Black Mask, the authorities, or Batman. Eventually, Red Hood causes such a ruckus stealing Black Mask's shipment of kryptonite that Batman was also intending on stealing that the two inevitably cross paths. It's not until Red Hood has a standoff with Batman that he removes his mask to reveal that he's Jason Todd to Bruce. Bruce obviously doesn't initially believe this person in front of him can be Jason since he's been duped before. So Jason gives Bruce his blood so he can scan his DNA to know for certain. And before his explosive exit, he declares to Bruce that he will be everything Bruce is supposed to be. He will cross that line and kill those who are deserving, and finally bring peace to Gotham to prove that Bruce's code doesn't work. After making his exit, he ends up finding the Joker and keeps him held captive, torturing him relentlessly for days on end with the same crowbar Joker used to kill him. This, you can imagine, makes Jason feel pretty good. After this, Bruce takes Jason's DNA and the scans all run a match. Bruce and Alfred, now knowing Jason is alive, there's a moment where Alfred asks if he shall remove Jason's suit from the cave. The reminder to Bruce of his greatest failure, since Jason's alive now. But Bruce refuses, saying it doesn't change anything at all. Jason is still his greatest failure. As the nights continue to pass, Black Mask's operation would soon begin to crash down with no chance of ever arising again. A massive oversimplification of events, but after so much bloodshed, Jason sends Bruce an invitation for their final showdown where it all began. By this point, Bruce 100% believes that Jason fully intends on taking his revenge on Bruce for not saving him. Meanwhile, over with Jason in the middle of torturing the Joker, the Joker figures out that the Red Hood is the same Robin he killed years ago, but questions why he'd even keep him alive, unless he's just like his bat daddy. Jason roundhouse kicks the Joker and stabs a knife through the Joker's shoulder and says to him that he has nothing in common with the Batman explaining to the Joker that he keeps him alive to use as bait for Batman, and he just loves kicking the crap out of him as an added bonus. The Joker thinks that Jason's turning out to be just like him since he's also sporting the same digs he used to wear, but Jason replies back that he's nothing like him at all. He knows what he does and why he does it, whereas the Joker is clinically insane. Only Jason knows Joker's biggest secret. He gets real close to the Joker, and says that he's not nearly as crazy as he'd like everyone else to believe. He just plays the part of the mad sadistic clown to drown out all the horror he's brought upon the city, saying he's crazy, but he ain't that crazy. Walking away hysterically laughing, because he finally managed to wipe a smile off the Joker's face. Eventually, Batman arrives to where it all began, Crime Alley. This is where Bruce Wayne became Batman, this is where Batman found Jason, and now it's where it all comes to an end. Red Hood makes his presence, and the two get ready for a fight until a fucking nuke goes off in Bloodhaven. This isn't some event construed by Red Hood, this is more sort of just something that happens by happenstance while they're in Crime Alley. And Jason remarks that it's funny. One son returns from the grave, while another son enters one. Bruce sees all the destruction caused left in horror. He's losing one of his sons all over again, 
too late to do anything. I think I like forgot to mention, but Bloodhaven is Nightwing's home. That's why it's so important. Instinctively, Bruce runs towards Bloodhaven to get to Nightwing. But Jason stops him and is like, nah, you're gonna handle this situation with me first. What follows is a gut-wrenching fight between the two of them with counters on top of counters and mix-ups the both of them used to practice together when Batman and Robin. As the two fight against one another, it isn't heroic or triumphant, but tragic. All Batman wants to do is save his son, but knows he is just too far gone. Telling Jason that he failed to save him before, but he's trying to save him now. That's when Jason flips everything in Bruce's head and tells Bruce that he forgives Bruce for not saving him, but demands to know why. Why of all people, the Joker is still alive. Blindly, stupidly disregarding the entire graveyards he's filled, the thousands who have suffered, the friends he's crippled. Jason thought, at the very least, that after his death, Bruce would have killed the Joker. Because if the Joker had taken Bruce from him, he would have done nothing but search the planet for this pathetic pile of evil death-worshipping garbage and send him off to hell. Batman cuts in and tells Jason that he's never understood why he's never killed the Joker. There isn't a day that goes by that Bruce doesn't think about subjecting Joker to every horrendous torture he's dealt onto others, and then finally killing him. But if he does that, if he crosses that line, he'd never come back. Jason cuts in and says that he isn't talking about killing the Riddler or Two-Face, or Scarecrow. He's talking about just killing the Joker. Just him. And doing it because he took him away from Bruce. But Bruce just can't do it. So Jason gives Bruce an ultimatum. Bruce will have to decide whether he lets Jason kill the Joker, or he kills Jason to save the Joker. With no sign of stopping, Batman throws a battering at the very last second before firing right in Jason's neck. Batman manages to win, but everyone still loses as Jason detonates C4 surrounding the three of them, blowing up the entire building. Batman manages to survive the explosion and scours the building, but never finds the bodies of Joker or Jason. And the story comes to a close with Batman getting sucked into another huge crisis event called Final Crisis. After that huge blowout with Batman and the Joker, Red Hood kind of stays quiet for a while, until he remembers Tim Drake is a thing. The guy pretty much replaced Jason a few issues after he died as the new Robin, and Jason is a bit jealous of the guy. So Red Hood drugs each of the Titans inside Titan's tower but Tim so he can confront him uninterrupted. And Jason's basically like, you have a dad, you sleep on a bed every night, and you go to school. Well, I never had any of that. Jason rips off his uniform to reveal that he has a Robin suit on underneath and demands to see what made Tim so special he just had to be the next Robin. The whole time he fights Tim, it's very clear that Jason is better than Tim in terms of combat, not really giving him time to breathe whatsoever. Tim does the best he can to fight back against Jason, but Jason ultimately wins. And in a way, Jason respects Tim for never giving up in the face of adversity so he spares him in the end and heads off to his next destination. So y'all remember how Bloodhaven blew up and everyone thought Nightwing had died, right? Nah, he turned out to be completely fine. Jason hears about this and decides what better way to reunite with Dick than to pose as Nightwing and start killing people to discredit everything the symbol stands for. He goes around killing criminals for a bit and has a little showdown with Dick until he gets eaten by whatever the fuck this thing is. And then, like, turns into a fucking John Carpenter monster, which... I guess isn't permanent, I, I, like, I really can't say, cause it just never gets brought back up again. And in case it couldn't get any weirder, Jason also gets summoned to fight in a multiversial war alongside Donna Troy and Kyle Rayner. And it leads to many different crazy adventures with the trio, where they go to different worlds like Gotham by Gaslight, or a gender-bent world where Jason flirts with the Atom, and they even go to a world where Jason reunites with a different Batman who ended up killing the Joker after the Joker had killed Jason, where Jason ends up becoming his Red Robin for a short while till his eventual death. There's also this very brief yet sad moment where Jason grieves over Batman till an alternate Earth Joker starts laughing at Jason. So Jason, in the most cathartic way possible, drops a boulder on the Joker's fucking head. Final Crisis inevitably comes to an end by this point, and if you've watched plenty of different videos on my channel, you'll know by the end that Batman makes an incredible exception for his no-kill rule and kills Darkseid, dying himself in the process. Following Bruce's death, he left messages for each of the Bat family members, including Jason, so Tim personally invites Jason to the Batcave to receive his message. When Jason listens to Bruce's message, whatever Bruce said only causes Jason to snap completely, leading to the events 
of an event called Battle for the Cowl. In this storyline, every villain pretty much knows that Batman is dead, so chaos and destruction occur all over Gotham. Every member of the Bat family, including some of Batman's lesser known allies, step in to do whatever they can, but their efforts are all stretched completely thin. Since without Batman, Gotham falls under complete ruin. Alfred, Tim, Cassandra, and many others look to Dick to take up the mantle of Batman, but Dick refuses to take on that responsibility out of respect for Bruce. However, in the midst of all the chaos, a new Batman arises, sporting guns and killing whomever he comes across, leaving a calling card saying, I am Batman. After this new Batman manages to kill a group of thugs, he later runs into Nightwing and Damian Wayne hot on his trail. And after a bit of back and forth between Dick and this new gun-toning Batman, Dick deduces that the person under the cowl is none other than Jason Todd. Once discovered, Jason shoots Damien in the chest to distract Dick long enough to execute his escape. And in different comics during this event, we get different points of view of Jason being Batman, where some people really take a liking to a Batman finally killing criminals while others feel scared. One panel that I really wanted to draw attention to that I found to be visually striking is this panel of Jason as Batman after stopping a pair of thugs in front of a little girl. The way Jason looks is incredibly disturbing but this moment where he looks to the girl and sees hope on her face at the sight of Batman, and the way he's drawn, it evoked a level of hope I never thought could be achieved given the militaristic look he sports. When Dick inevitably returns to the cave with Damien after being shot and needing medical assistance from Alfred, Tim Drake in retaliation begins a search to stop Jason and dresses as Batman in order to demonstrate how the real Batman would have acted. Tim finds Jason Todd's Batcave in a subway station and is saved from a booby trap by Catwoman. Soon after this, Jason ambushes them and rushes into a grueling fight with Tim like the last time, only this time it ends with Jason impaling Tim in the chest with a battering, exclaiming, one more to go. After questioning himself following Damien's near death, Nightwing goes forth against Jason, intending to take down Jason once and for all. During their fight, Dick begs for Jason to stop this madness and to find peace, as that was Bruce's final wish to Jason before dying. Playing Bruce's final message, in which Bruce tells Jason that he was his biggest failure. In truth, Jason was a broken child, and Bruce thought he could make him whole. But he went about it all wrong. Jason needed repairing, but instead Bruce had given Jason only more pain and suffering. But he tells Jason that it isn't too late to change for the better and seek help. Hearing the message again, Jason's anger gets the better of him. And Dick uses this to get the upper hand as the fight escalates to a final showdown atop of a speeding train. Eventually, Dick wins against Jason, but in attempting to help Jason, Jason refuses and falls to his supposed death, though claiming that they would see each other again soon. Through Dick defeating Jason and seeing how Jason warped the image of Batman, Knowing what it truly means to be Batman, Dick finally dons the cowl, making way for my favorite arc, Batman and Robin Reborn. Now fast forwarding a bit in time, Dick and Damien are kicking ass and taking names, really striking fear into the superstitious and cowardly lot of Gotham and doing a damn fine job of it. Only there's one psychopath that eludes the dynamic duo time and time again. That psychopath being Professor Pig. He's a villain basically obsessed with perfection. He performs the most obscene surgeries on his victims, like removing or replacing limbs, attaches doll face masks to their heads, and then turns them into his own personal mindless minions called Dollatrons. Why am I going over this, you may ask? Well, a little girl named Sasha gets mixed up in the pig's terror and becomes a victim of pig after having gone through the process of becoming a Dollatron herself. Luckily, Batman and Robin show up to stop pig before any more damage could be done to Sasha, but in going through the Dollatron process, she's left with a mask fused to her face that if removed, could kill her. Due to these circumstances, she ends up hating Batman and Robin for not saving her in time, while also keeping a psychotic lunatic like pig alive after everything he's done. Sasha puts all these innocent people used to become pig's Dolatrons out of their misery, and out of all the pig's horror, it gets the attention of Jason Todd. Jason essentially takes advantage of Sasha's hatred for the dynamic duo to become his partner. With his new partner Sasha donning the identity of Scarlet, Jason resumed his brutal and lethal methods of dealing with criminals. But now there was a twist. He exposed his methods to the public and actively marketed them as the way things should be done. In turn, public opinion was actually at least somewhat in his favor. However, whenever Scarlet began to question Jason's plan to rid crime from Gotham or feeling that what they'd be doing was too harsh, Jason, and 
yeah, he kind of returned to being a ginger for a bit, would turn around and use what had been done to Sasha as a justification for their heinous acts. For the short time that they were a team, Jason grew fond of Sasha and saw her as a once younger version of him. Eventually, the two dynamic duos would end up fighting against each other, and Jason and Sasha would end up winning the fight, and locking them out of their way to reveal to the world on a Twitter webcam the identities of Batman and Robin if the public offered enough attention to it. It was then that Jason and Sasha were ambushed by an assassin called Flamingo. Basically, Flamingo royally fucks up the pair and nearly kills Jason if not for Batman and Robin escaping from his trap. Something that I also found to be very interesting was that when Flamingo was kind of bringing Jason to the brink of death like the Joker did, Jason just keeps shouting that he'll come back anyway. It doesn't matter if he dies. But through Batman and Robin kind of coming in clutch and saving both Sasha and Jason, Jason operates a fucking excavator and crushes Flamingo to death with it, while Sasha ends up escaping, after which Jason ends up being taken into police custody, where Jason is immediately transferred over to Arkham. Now, during all this craziness, Bruce Wayne eventually returns from the grave after a crazy time travel adventure because Darkseid sent Bruce's soul through time and didn't really kill Bruce, only his corporeal form, if that makes any sense to you. But if not, just do what I do when something doesn't make sense and just don't think about it. Anyway, when Bruce returns, he occasionally visits Arkham to check on Jason and gather intel from him while he's on the inside. And over time, Jason earns a second chance with Bruce and checks out of Arkham. It's here where Bruce begins his endeavor called Batman Incorporated, where the plan is to essentially have a Batman for each country around the globe. Bruce appoints Jason to be one of the many Batman around the globe, with the one rule being to never kill anyone ever, so long as he's in Gotham. And while the rest of the Bat family really don't mess with Bruce's choice of letting Jason rejoin the Bat family, Bruce refuses to give up hope that his son can be better with the second chance he's been given. And everything is right as rain until the Flash is used to basically refresh the entirety of the DC continuity, leading into an event called New 52. The New 52 saw to a complete revamp of DC's lineup so that it could allow new readers to hop in with a basic knowledge of the character with not much else and go from there. Along with that, it also saw to make everything that ever happened in most heroes' careers, like Batman for instance, happen in a total of five years. God, that's kind of dramatic when you really think about it. But with Jason, basically his entire origin remains the same. He goes to Ethiopia, finds his mom, gets greeted on by the Joker, explodes and dies, comes back to life, dipped in the Lazarus pit, becomes a corrupted version of himself, and tries to get revenge on Batman for not killing the Joker. Mostly about everything else I talked about for the last while got thrown in the dumpster, but hey, at least Red Hood ended up getting his own series called Red Hood and the Outlaws. Ugh... Why does it have a mouth? Comprising of Red Hood, Arsenal, and Starfire, they're pinned out to be the team of broken misfits that meet under the craziest of circumstances. As each issue of the series follows the trio on some crazy, spiritual, and otherwise explosive adventure, with the three of them each all trying to conquer their deepest traumas to come out of them better heroes. Jason constantly seeks to run away from his past of being Batman's greatest failure, Roy Harper pretty much loses everything and spirals into becoming a raging alcoholic, and Starfire is consumed with rage from her awful upbringing. But through each adventure the three of them share, the closer it brings them all to enlightenment. One journey with the pair that I'm incredibly fond of involving Jason was the fleshing out of his origin, becoming Red Hood, and the training he went through at a mystical place referred to as the All Castle. To break it down for you in the simplest way possible, the All Castle is kind of like the Hogwarts of crime fighting. However, it ends up withered and destroyed by an outsider called the Untitled. Jason gets word of this and does whatever he can to avenge his fallen friends, even sacrificing his fondest memory to find the one responsible. A memory of Jason too sick to go out as Robin, sharing the night with Bruce until falling asleep by his side. And in making this sacrifice, he finds the one responsible and avenges the All Castle's people. Then the Court of Owls show up. The Court of Owls are known as an ancient society who have used their vast resources to shape Gotham into their image for hundreds of years. And after Bruce discovers their existence, he ends up going missing for two weeks, captured by the Court, sending Gotham into complete disarray. Jason reluctantly reluctantly returns to Gotham to help Bruce and the Bat family stop Freeze from helping the court take control of Gotham. And by doing this, Jason earns back the trust he had lost from the Bat family as they take notice of his changed ways. There is still the occasional mistrust and banter of course, but they all have the patience to never let it get too much out of hand. There is even one really funny instance where Damien got the surprise on Jason and kicked the shit out of him to prove that he was a better Robin and then just kinda stole his helmet. Remember Joker? 
Well, over the time he's been out of the picture, he's been plotting something mischievous and has become even more insane, cutting off his own face to then wear his face like a cheap mask from Spirit Halloween. Joker basically deduces the identities of every member of the Bat family and torments them all, like Damien, Tim, Dick, and takes Alfred hostage. Inevitably, the Joker kidnaps the entire Bat family and leads everyone to believe that the Joker had cut off each of their faces to be fed to them. However, Batman puts an end to the Joker's evil plot and manages to save the day like he always does does. But Jason's still so traumatized from what the Joker has done to him and still continues to do, Jason is afraid to take off the bandages and fear that the Joker may have just singled him out for some sick joke, only to find out that the Joker really didn't do it. So relieved, Jason packed up to leave for Gotham with the outlaws, says his goodbyes to the Bat family, puts on his helmet, and acid mixed with Joker toxin spews all over his face. Jason gets all fucked up and slips into a coma where he sees all his memories from an outsider's perspective, realizing that for all the time he's been back to life, he's done nothing but play into the Joker's game by tormenting Batman. He's let his death from the hands of the Joker define his every being as the Robin who died, refusing to change and seek help. But through these visions, when Jason wakes up, he finally breaks the dam that's been holding back all his pain and sadness, embracing Bruce, breaking down into tears. Damien dies. Bruce goes crazy over his death and tries to find any way possible to bring him back. So Bruce takes Jason to the site of where he died to see if he could remember what brought him back. But this only makes Jason more resentful towards Bruce. A little bit later, Bruce finds a way to bring back Damien from the grave by using a mystical crystal, but Darkseid has Damien's body just because. So Bruce rallies the Bat family together for a last ditch attempt to claim Damien's body back, stick the crystal inside of him, and bring Damien back to life. Long story short, this works through the Bat family coming to his aid, and Damien comes back to life, and then Batman dies. And then Bruce comes back, but he has no clue he's Batman due to amnesia. Jason also gets his mind wiped because he's just so fucking tired of having to go to bed every night and remembering the fucking time he got crowbarred to death. Then he gets his memories back. Arsenal and Starfire become a thing. They break up. And the team fight dudes like Lobo or numerous alien armies or mystical cults around the world or numerous aliens or mystical cults or alien armies. Or and after so many adventures, like maybe too many adventures, the team all end up going their separate ways. With the series ending on Jason saying, we were friends, helping each other pick up the pieces of our lives. We were outlaws. This series for me was pretty good, but I'd be lying to myself and to everyone watching this video if I didn't tell the honest truth that this was kind of a hard series to get through at times due to how repetitive it felt. Anyway, you know how I said the outlaws end up all going their separate ways? Well, this development kind of gets brushed aside as Jason teams up with Arsenal right after the end of their series as they go on even more adventures around the globe. Somewhere around this time, an event called Robin War happens, and it's basically the Robins versus the Court of Owls due to the disappearance of Bruce no longer being Batman. And then Arsenal gets kidnapped. A broadcast is sent throughout the entire world to put a vote whether Arsenal should live or die. This acts as an homage to how Jason's fate was decided decades ago where people could call a number to decide Jason's fate at the hands of the Joker. Of course, Majority voted for his death, and everyone in this story does the same. Saving Arsenal in the nick of time by killing the people holding him hostage alive in front of the world, Arsenal says to Jason that he can pretty much never associate himself with Jason ever again for the sake of preserving his image. While Jason tells Arsenal to grow up, 300,000 people voted to kill him because they could, and he's worried about what they'll think of him now, Jason shuts down the broadcast and basically tells Arsenal that the whole hero for hire thing was never going to work between the two of them. Because people like him or Starfire have too much faith in people, whereas Jason has none, as they both end up going their separate ways. Leading into a soft reboot known as Rebirth, meant to blend both the New 52 and the original timelines together. Jason's origin is retreaded going over his time at Ma Gun's orphanage, getting taken in by Bruce, the events leading up to his death, and everything pretty much remains somewhat the same, jumping off from where Jason's series had ended. Returning to Gotham to put an end to the Black Mask after assassinating the mayor with a Technovirus, Jason crashes through a window holding Ma Gun in his arms, with Ma Gun appearing to be dead until Jason successfully resuscitates her. Following this, Ma Gun explains that after her operation of making her boys her personal henchmen, she went to jail for a few years. She got out recently and wants to make up for all the harm she's caused. Jason asks Ma Gun if anyone would want to do this to her, and Ma Gun explains to Jason that she had dinner with the Black Mask a few days ago, basically to establish that Black Mask owns all establishments in Gotham, and if she or anybody tries anything funny, they'll all face the consequences. So Jason plays it all smart and studies Black Mask's operations till he can find him in some place where he has his pants down. When the pair meet, 
Black Mask proposes the idea for Jason to be his second in command, and an error if Black Mask were to bite the dust. Jason agrees with Black Mask, only to be a man on the inside and hit him where it hurts. Where afterwards, Black Mask sends Jason onto a mission to secure a game changer of a weapon on a train coming to Gotham. The heist goes pretty smoothly until one of the train doors blasts open with a woman shouting that she is Artemis. Jason really doesn't pay much mind to this at all, and is basically like, yeah, uh, my boss is actually watching me, and he's judging my performance, so I'd really prefer it if you just stepped aside. And Artemis is basically like, no. So Jason starts blasting, where Artemis picks up Jason to deliver the killing blow until Jason's like, before you kill me, what's even on that train? Meanwhile, Black Mask's crew try to escape with the cargo. In an attempt to recapture the cargo, Artemis throws Jason into the train cart and crashes into it herself only seconds later, where they both end up laying their eyes upon Superman in a tank. Until something starts to go wrong with Superman's appearance till he becomes something so bizarre to the human eye, where it turns out to be Bizarro. While bringing Bizarro to life, Jason looks to Bizarro and sees himself coming back to life, having no say on if he even wanted to come back, or how painful it felt to come back, and then the ultimate fear of what he'd end up becoming. Cradling this supposed weapon of mass destruction, Jason can't help but see himself in Bizarro. Black Mask ends up keeping Bizarro locked away inside a cell, forced to watch clips of the real Superman being a hero, hoping that one day Bizarro can learn to be normal. Whereas Jason treats Bizarro like an actual human being and shows compassion to Bizarro, bringing down gifts and to occasionally listen to his thoughts. Jason comes to see Bizarro one day to find him furious that he'll never be the real Superman, and how Black Mask sees him as nothing but a monster. Bizarro freaks out and starts smashing everything in sight, including throwing Jason around a few times. But despite Bizarro's violence, Jason knows if he fights him, he'll never get through to him and actually be able to help. So he holds up a Superman plushie in the spur of the moment and tells Bizarro to tell the plushie how he feels. Where Bizarro says that he's sad. Everyone thought me am Superman. But me am not. Me am Bizarro. Me am alone. Jason tells Bizarro that he isn't alone, and that he is his friend, same with Artemis as they sit together playing with the Bizarro plushie. Black Mask watches over Jason the entire time diffusing the situation with Bizarro, and decides to lay all his cards flat on the table with Jason, and basically tells Jason he's known since the beginning that Jason has been a double agent, but that he'd be willing to forgive Jason if he joins him in recreating Gotham in his own image. However, Jason takes a hard pass on the evil villain proposition, so Black Mask injects himself with a vial of purple juice that in simple terms allows him to control Bizarro injected with the same purple juice because it directly hacks the brain. I don't know, comics. But at the very last second, the virus Black Mask injected himself with goes haywire as his mind begins to merge with Bizarro's. Black Mask sees everything everywhere. He sees just how little his pursuit to recreate Gotham weighs against the grand scale of the vast cosmos, and Black Mask realizes he is nothing in the end. Black Mask begs for the cure, but Jason instead smashes it in front of him and says that he can't kill him because of his promise to Batman but that doesn't mean he has to save him either. After everything, Bizarro regains control of himself and apologizes endlessly to Red Hood and Artemis, becoming the Outlaws, or the Dark Trinity, as one thread called them because they're not your dad's big three. But what happened to Black Mask? Well, after the fiasco, Black Mask pretty much became brain dead, and funnily enough, Jason put him under Ma Gun's care, pretty much leaving us with the message that what goes around comes around. In the next issue, which for me might possibly be the best in the entire series, Jason is trying to eliminate the drug trade in Gotham by holding a meet with several different drug lords that worked under Black Mask. None of the drug lords take a liking to Jason's idea, so they all hold up their guns, which is Bizarro's cue to tear shit up. At first, everything seems to go okay, till Bizarro goes a little too far, and it only gets worse when Killer Croc shows up and hits Jason by surprise. Enraged, Bizarro decapitates Killer Croc. Luckily, it's a robot Killer Croc. But Jason asks Bizarro if he knew, and Bizarro basically says that he didn't know. I know that the panel speaks otherwise, but keep in mind that it's because whatever Bizarro says means the opposite. Arriving back to their new base under Magun's orphanage, Jason and Artemis argue about whether or not they can actually keep Bizarro in line. Especially after doing some digging in old LexCorp files to find old video footage of the Superman cloning project. At first, several scientists felt that this project would turn out to be an astronomical accomplishment for the company. Until things just started going wrong at every turn. Sometimes when the clones left their pods, they'd either die instantly, or they'd awake rageful, killing everyone in their path, to only die days later. Lex Luthor, after the fact, had the entire project scrapped, and it's only based from sheer luck that the Bizarro they have now was displaced during the process. After watching the footage, Artemis leaves it to Jason on whether or not they should kill Bizarro, due to the monster he could very well become. So Jason arrives to Wayne Manor to ask Alfred if Bruce ever thought of Jason as a disappointment, or if he ever regretted taking him under his wing. Alfred tells Jason that Bruce never regretted taking him in, 
and he's always believed in him to do the right thing, even in his darkest of days. With that, Jason takes a sliver of kryptonite and rides off to a very far and beautiful place. Jason and Bizarro both settle down beside a pond, and Jason tells Bizarro of how he was raised in Gotham streets, where buildings felt so tall and together, it always felt like it was nighttime. For that, Jason hated the world because Gotham was the only place he ever knew. But this place changed his perspective when he first found it, and that scared him. Bizarro goes on to say that he doesn't hate the world, but what he does hate is the memories he has of another life that's not his own. Memories of flying, meeting friends, saving lives. But he hates that. Or at least he did until he met Red Hood and Artemis. Bizarro admits that he isn't perfect, but with Jason and Artemis by his side, he promises to be the best Bizarro he can possibly be. Jason with his gun trained at Bizarro, he thinks for a moment, and sets down the gun to sit beside Bizarro for a bit, because Bizarro likes this place. And then Bizarro goes and has a fucking heart attack. This happens because of Bizarro's lifespan only lasting just a few weeks. What follows is a really emotional moment between the outlaws with Bizarro saying that me am at home now, me am with friends, and asks them to take care of his Superman plushie before passing away. They both take the plushie and remain silent for a moment. Until BOOM! Lex fucking Luthor shows up and he's like, Step back, you buffoons. Only Lex Luthor can save Bizarro. He basically finds out that Bizarro was opposite to Superman in every way, right down to his DNA matrix. So where kryptonite would hurt Superman, kryptonite for Bizarro makes the boo-boo go away. I bet he's glad he didn't pull that trigger. Luther arrives to tell the outlaws that Bizarro may be different when they next see him, but they'll at least have custody over the guy now. So when they walk up to Bizarro, they are visibly concerned when his IQ goes from 30 to 300. From here, Bizarro appoints himself as the new leader of the outlaws. He creates a base that spans forever with an armory, a garage, a war room, and a door that can take them anywhere. Bizarro explains how this all works, but I'm honestly too stupid to simplify it so let's carry on. With the doorway able to go anywhere, now if a crime happens with some villain of the week, they can simply teleport to their location and nab him up. And what's actually crazy to me is the outlaws stop so much crime with this doorway in Gotham that other heroes are like, yo, save some crime for the rest of us, unless you want your ass beat. The only thing is, the more time that passes, the more Bizarro loses his newfound intelligence. The only way to counteract the effects is for Bizarro to continue dosing himself with kryptonite. Only the more he does it, it also mucks up his mind. So he's damned if he does, and damned if he doesn't. It eventually gets to a point where it's painfully obvious something's wrong with him when he starts licking the shit off the ground and blacking out while on missions. Over time, the three begin to drift apart, doing their own things, which also in turn scares Bizarro. A letter arrives addressed to Jason from his father, Willis Todd. Strange considering Two-Face killed him, but as Jason reads the letter, he feels that his father may have faked his own death. Through the letters, Willis tells of the first time he ever met Jason's mother by selling her drugs. One thing led to another, and they became the worst parents in the world. Through Willis working full-time as a drug dealer, Jason's mother would constantly use to the point of having several overdoses. Around the same time, Jason also started getting sick constantly due to his mother using while pregnant. As medical bills to keep Jason healthy built up, Willis felt he had no no other choice than to roll in with Two-Face. Then with Freeze, and then the Riddler, and after a few times being a henchman, it eventually got him a battle scar from the Batman. Being a henchman wasn't glamorous, but if it meant keeping Jason alive and well, it was worth it to Willis. Eventually Willis went to work under the Penguin. Only the Penguin didn't want a henchman, but more so a fall guy to do 20 years time meant for Penguin. Through his time in jail, he mentions in a letter that he'll take part in some kind of science experiment, and if the whole thing goes well, with some wishful thinking, he'll get out quicker. And that was the final letter. Jason arrives to the Gotham Cemetery and digs up his father's grave to find that his body isn't there. Jason thinks to himself that he's always hated his father. He hated him ever since he abandoned Jason and his mom, and he was happier then when he found out he died in jail. And now he reads these letters about how much his father cared, and how his father never really died, and Jason hates his father even more for making him care about him again. Jason attacks the Penguin at the grand opening of the Ice Patch Carnival in front of dozens with cameras broadcasting everything, while Penguin wants to know what this is all about, as Jason says it's about Willis Todd. Meanwhile, Bizarro's addiction has gotten worse to the point he has set their home base to self-destruct. Artemis tries to do whatever she can, but without Bizarro in his right mind, and Jason all the way with Penguin, it looks bad for the outlaws. Tired of the merry-go-round and the game of cops and robbers, Jason tells Penguin that he didn't come to take him to jail, only to finally end it. Pointing the gun at his head, Penguin says Jason doesn't have the stones. He's too much like his bat dad. But Jason looks at him with the barrel of his gun right against his monocle and whispers a little secret. He's his father's son. Pulling the trigger, killing Penguin. Over in the Batcave, Bruce watched as Jason broke his promise to never kill again in Gotham. 
leading Bruce to head out into the city to put an end to the Red Hood. Artemis and Bizarro are doing everything they can to prevent the base from detonating. Yet nothing works because Bizarro lost all his smarts. While jumping through Gotham's skylines hoping to come across the base sooner rather than later, Bruce grapples onto Jason's foot yanking him down to a nearby building, and before he can even get a word out, Jason gets a mouthful of foot, following it up with Bruce saying he was a fool for ever believing in him. Jason chuckles and says he's never seen Batman hit the Joker this hard before, and he hates the Joker. Bruce hitting Jason over and over again for killing the Penguin, he screams that Red Hood will be no more, till Bizarro comes to the rescue and squishes him. Bizarro takes Jason to their base and hopes he can stop the imminent self-destruction, but neither Artemis or Jason have a clue on how to stop it, until Bizarro gets an idea to drag the entire base into their doorway to anywhere to stop it. Doing this, it creates a crazy wormhole, and Artemis chooses to go inside it to save Bizarro while Jason will stay in Gotham, and she gives him a kiss farewell, pushing him out of the base. Landing atop of a nearby building, Jason witnesses as the wormhole closes before Artemis and Bizarro can escape and Jason's worst fear of being alone comes true. And Batman's also right behind him. Totally ignoring that Jason just lost his friends, Bruce continues to beat the shit out of him, till an arrow hits Bruce, stunning him. And from the red smoke, Arsenal gets Jason on his feet. Roy helps Jason get back to tip-top fighting condition. While this is going on, Jason runs scans of Earth relentlessly trying to find Artemis or Bizarro. And going all over the world, the pair track down several leads, but when nothing comes up about Bizarro or Artemis, Jason trusts that he'll see them again when the time is right. Arriving back to America after turning up squat, Roy pulls the car aside to talk about how he wants to go to a place called Sanctuary, a place that can maybe get Roy on the right track to overcoming his own demons in a bottle. With that, the two say their goodbyes, and nothing can go wrong from here, right? Right? While Jason begins sporting this new look that, I'll be honest, is still kinda growing on me, he gets into a petty brawl in a diner till Bruce shows up to dissolve the situation. Jason thinks that another fight's incoming, but Bruce drops the bombshell that Roy Harper died while at Sanctuary. Jason, hearing this, wants to be sad, but knows that Roy would want him to rather spend his time being a hero. So as the two leave the diner, they share a brief hug and part ways. Later, Jason leaves a message for Roy about how mad he is that he died and how much of a mediocre archer he was, or how much of a half-assed hero he turned out to be. But in the end, he was his best friend, and he'll miss him until he sees him again someday. From here, I could basically say that Red Hood becomes a reacher and just goes from town to town kicking evildoers' asses and then off to the next town. Up until he arrives back to Gotham to take over Penguin's business, the Iceberg Lounge, becoming a crime-fighting crime lord. It's actually hella entertaining. Especially when Batman shows up to Jason's penthouse, irked that he's back, and he can't take him to jail or Arkham because if he takes him in on the attempted murder by Red Hood, he not only exposes Jason's identity, but by association, every Bat family member as well. So it just kind of puts these two in a very awkward position where Batman basically has to tolerate Jason while Jason does whatever he can to tick off Bruce. My reasoning for Jason doing this is of him feeling alone. Jason by this point has lost everything he's worked so hard to get back all in one fell swoop. He lost his friends, he lost all the progress he made, and most of all he lost his family again. Everyone thinks of him as this rough and tough villain, and no matter how hard he's tried for years to prove anyone wrong, it just doesn't matter. So Jason uses all this anger, fear, and resentment and puts it all in a bullet targeted towards crime, as a new drug hits Gotham streets called Cheer Drops. It's a drug that gives people a sense of euphoria, along with extremely pleasant hallucinations. It sounds like a harmless drug, only since its creation, it's been destroying parts of Gotham, leaving people trapped in a mindless state, walking in front of cars, drowning or killing themselves, all while witnessing their greatest dream come true. While investigating, Jason finds where one of the teardrop dealers sells the product, only to find a scene all too familiar to Jason when he was a boy. A kid crying, scared out of his mind, wondering why his mom won't wake up. Jason does whatever he can to calm the kid down by saying his mom is just asleep, calling an ambulance, and asking about where his father may be or what his name is. The boy Tyler says his dad is at work, so Jason chooses to take Tyler with him by his side till he can find his dad. Through help from Oracle, Jason tracks the father's phone to an abandoned warehouse. Jason tells Tyler to hide for a while until Jason comes back with his dad, giving his mask to Tyler. Tyler asks what his superhero name is, so Jason says the Red Hood, so Tyler names himself 
himself the Blue Hood, because he likes the color blue. Jason sneaks into the warehouse and fights off a bunch of goons John Wick style until he finds Tyler's father. Jason tells him that his wife overdosed off of teardrops and he has his son with him nearby. But the father could care less though about the two of them, and admits he's grateful his wife overdosed, wishing Tyler would do the same after the many times he drugged him to keep him quiet. It doesn't even take a moment for Jason to fire every round into Tyler's dad, and it's only after the echoes of the gunfire stop that Jason realizes he just killed Tyler's father. Soon after, Batman shows up and he's like, Ah, oh, you killed again, you know how much I don't like that. Only while fighting, Tyler jumps in the middle to save Jason. But Batman gives Tyler a lollipop. And while distracted, Bruce and Jason go off on each other about Jason killing Tyler's scumbag of a father. So they leave Tyler with Dr. Leslie Tompkins and head off to investigate any lead they possibly can. Only everywhere they turn, the trail runs cold. Maybe too cold. <laughs> Looking for a hit of something? After splitting up with Batman, one of the leads brings Jason to Mr. Freeze. Only while Jason fights Freeze, he realizes he's severely outmatched. In a crazy series of events, Jason is nearly broken into a thousand pieces till Batman shows up at the very last second, beating everyone to a bloody pulp, saving Jason. Only for Batman to end up frozen and drugged by the villain Cheer, who's been developing the Cheer Drops drug. Go figure. Jason manages to escape Cheer and finds refuge in a nearby backup cave, storing several bat suits, gadgets, etc. Coming to Batman's aid, he uses a special heat suit to quickly defeat Mr. Freeze, until Jason gets hit by a lucky punch from a random goon, leading Jason to inhale some Cheer gas. The gas shows Jason his perfect dream, a world where Batman finally did it. He killed the Joker and let go of Batman. A world with no more need for masks. A world where they can all finally just be a normal family. This dream is so enthralling that Jason almost mentally checks out until locking the fuck in. Jason does what he's always struggled with and calls in help from the entire Bat family. Jason realizes he isn't alone and that someone will always have his back. With the Bat family taking down Cheer's goons and Freeze, Jason administers the cure, snapping Batman out of his perfect dream with nothing but rage for Cheer. Catching up with Cheer, Batman yells that Scarecrow was a monster who showed him his fears. Fears he already knew existed and could handle, but Cheer showed him everything he ever wanted, yet could never have. Batman considers killing him, till ironically Jason talks him out of it. With nothing more to do, Batman breaks down attempting to apologize to Jason. Three weeks later, Tyler and his mom, still recovering, are moved into better housing courtesy of Bruce. And for Tyler being the greatest superhero ever, Jason gives Tyler a fresh new blue hoodie. Along with this, Jason chats with Bruce on everything that happened after taking down Cheer. Now that the drug is off the streets, everything's slightly back to normal, and Bruce thanks Jason for saving him. Jason also expresses that after killing Tyler's father, he will never use guns again. He's realized finally that while he thinks some people should die, he doesn't want to hurt anyone else with death having a way of rippling out to others. With that, Jason and Bruce say their goodbyes, and Bruce says while leaving that life is too short for them to always be at odds. As Bruce sits in his car looking at Jason right off through his rearview mirror, he reflects on what he saw from the cheer gas. A life where Batman and Jason together finally killed the Joker after so long, paving the way for a brighter future for Gotham and his family. Returning home, Jason finds a package from Bruce with a note saying, Family Dinner Thursday. And within the package contains a Red Hood uniform meant for Jason to wear someday. And that someday has yet to come. Since Jason passed the story has just really been through the ringer, and I'm personally not really a big fan of it. I read the Gotham War event, which basically ends with Batman giving Jason brain damage to never be a hero again, and right after this, Joker poisons Jason to become his more villainous self again. For me, Jason is a person that will take three steps forward and then two steps back. And when you get down to it, that's really the point of him. It's that struggle to get past his much more darker tendencies that makes him an incredibly endearing character. He'll always try to be the best version of himself he can possibly be, and he'll always stumble and fall on his way getting there. And comics will always continue to go down otherwise great stories, or sometimes hilariously bad ones. And the greatest thing any of us can do is pick a version of the character we most like, and make up our own ending of the character. For me, I cope, and I choose to believe that after this story, Jason finally understood what it meant to be a symbol for hope because of Tyler, rather than being a symbol of vengeance. And that through his path to becoming a hero, he'd no longer define his life by being Batman's greatest failure. But somehow through his long and arduous journey, Jason became Batman's greatest achievement. I also completely forgot to mention that Jason does reunite with Artemis and Bizarro. I didn't want to just leave y'all hanging on that, but it's only for a few issues before they all go their separate ways. To make way for an event called my cat doesn't want me to finish this video. Well, there's an event called The Hill involving Jason that I have yet to read, so I have no idea where that's going.
But if you'll excuse me, this has been my seminar on Jason Todd. I'm finally done with this video. It took so long to make, and there were like so many stories to read, but now I can finally rest and I can sleep on my bed for like a week or two, depending on how much y'all like this video. I really hope you guys like this video. I, I like, oh my gosh. But with that, my cat is meowing for food and uh, just don't forget to leave a like and all that jazz. And as always, I'll catch y'all on the flip side. See ya.